care about how the individual can be happy in himself uh, through the perspective of economics, and no, I don't need that. <laughs> no one took you that way. Now we do. Okay, now he does. All right. So, when you're looking individual, you got to think about two things. Oh, by the way, I want this to be as informal as possible. If you have questions, ask them right on the spot. Okay. So we start with two fallacies. Um, these are things you should not believe because they are false. <laughs> <laughs> The fallacy of composition says the following. If it is true for the individual, it is not necessarily true for the group. So you might think, well, oh, I mean, if everyone likes X, right, or if everything makes X person happy, then everyone else, like, like a group of people, is also going to be made happy by that. So this isn't true. The best example, of course, is say you're a football fan, right? And your friend says, hey, you know, if you want to beat the traffic for the football game, you should leave five minutes early. Now this works great for the individual. It even works great for like four or five individuals. But imagine what would happen if everyone in the stadium left five minutes early in order to beat the traffic rush. It wouldn't work, right? So there are plenty of examples like this um, for, for all kinds of different reasons. Um, so if you, you know, a business model for say a small business in economics is not going to work for the economy of a country. For example, specializing in a single export might work for like one or two countries, but for the most part, if the United States specialized entirely in one export and, and did not diversify sideways or, um, you know, linearly, uh, it, it would work. So that's the first one. Essentially, anything I say about the individual, you should not necessarily apply to the group unless you have a very good reason to think that you can eliminate all the problems with the translation. <laughs> and the fallacy of causation means that essentially, if the two happen at the same time, they don't necessarily copy each other. Uh, for example, Christmas letters go out before Christmas. I want to stop Christmas. Let's get rid of all the Christmas letters. <laughs> that is wrong. <laughs> all right. So if we can't say, if we can't look at groups of people, if we can't look at um, correlations as, and say, oh, this causes happiness, this bad causes happiness, how on earth are we going to look at the individual? And the best way to look at it is obviously to make assumptions. So I want you guys to forget everything you know for a second, all right? I'm going to take you to the world of economics in which people behave rationally, and at least they don't here, trust me, they don't, <laughs> and English cows are spherical. <laughs> okay, so let's say you're an individual walking on the street, not friends. Um, okay. How... How many apples would you be willing to buy today? On, on a typical day, let's say you, let's say we're trying to get lunch. How many apples would you eat on an average day? Two at the most. Two at the most, right? If I gave you three apples, would you be happy about that, or like I just gave you three apples? Sure, I'd save one for later. Right, and if I give you four? Yeah, I could save two for later. What if I gave you fifty? What if I just like got this big sack and dumped fifty <laughs> apples at first? Like they're yours. I would not want fifty apples. You would not want fifty apples, right? And I'm pretty sure all of you have, I mean, unless you have a real apple fetish here, a bunch of roomies full of apples, <laughs> you would be very unhappy. <laughs> I'll always be telling you for apples looks like that. <laughs> you could sell the extra apples. And this is an assumption we're going to make later, which is essentially that individuals can't have too much of a good thing. But having a lot of a good thing can be a little bit bad. I'm going to show you here. So, if you were to plot Becky's desire for apples, right, we're going to call that the marginal benefit she gets from each apple. So how much benefit does she get from that to you? If she was starving, hungry, and I just gave her free apples, she'd be pretty happy about that, right? Um, this is the quantity of apples. Uh, and if I gave her another apple, she'd still be happy, right? That's sort of about how much she likes per day. And if I gave her a third apple, she wouldn't mind that much. But, you know, I mean, it's just one more apple. As we get out here consecutively, like, it's a lot of trouble to sell a hundred apples. So, well, she might enjoy the extra, like, two dollars, 
of like utility and user, there's definitely this sort of logistic tension. What we call this is diminishing marginal returns. We're going to assume this for almost any individual we look at. This is not necessarily true. You can create a utility function in which someone has increasing marginal returns, right? Let's say someone, their only dream is to buy a swimming pool, right? Right, and they're counting on only you to give them money, right? If you gave them $100, they would derive no utility from it because they couldn't buy a swimming pool with only $100. It would not be until you gave them a million dollars, right, for a really fancy swimming pool that the utility would go up here and then it would stay constant because once they have their swimming pool, they don't care anymore. So that's an alternative <laughs> utility function, but it's not what we're going to look at. It's a little weird. <laughs>
let's say you have some reason.